Good morning, everyone. You are extremely welcome at our session today, Parliament for Researchers, how to engage with devolved legislatures. My name's Naomi. I'm part of the Knowledge Exchange Unit at the UK Parliament. The Knowledge Exchange Unit supports and strengthens the exchange of information and expertise between the UK Parliament and the research community. We do that in various ways. So we run training. Uh, we have lots of online resources for researchers about how to work with the UK Parliament. We promote opportunities that we find for researchers to contribute to UK Parliament. We run academic fellowships at UK Parliament and uh, we're really a point of contact um, for anyone who is looking to engage with UK Parliament um, from the research community. So I'm really pleased uh, that I am joined today uh, by some colleagues from the UK Parliament, my colleague Sarah Foxen, who you'll meet a bit later, who will be keeping an eye on your questions. And my colleague Laura Webb is uh, helping us in the background as well. And you're going to be hearing from um, some of our colleagues from the devolved uh, legislatures as well. So we're joined today by Emma Robinson from the Scottish Parliament. Uh, by Eileen Reagan from the Northern Ireland Assembly and by Hannah Johnson from the Welsh Parliament from Seneth Cymru. So before I hand over to our lovely guest speakers, um, I just want to refresh your knowledge a little bit about some, some kind of key concepts that we're going to be talking about today. And the first one is uh, to remind you all that Parliament is not the same as government. Uh, so a legislature is not the same as an executive. I'll tell you about the UK uh, Parliament and then you'll be hearing a bit more about the devolved context in a minute as well. In, for the UK Parliament in Westminster, Parliament is all MPs, House of Commons. It's all peers, members of the House of Lords uh, and the Queen is officially a part of Parliament as well. And the government, on the other hand, is just some MPs, some members of the House of Lords who've been chosen by the Prime Minister to be ministers, to run government departments um, and public services. And that government is accountable back to Parliament. One of Parliament's key roles is to hold government to account, as well as to make and pass laws um, and to approve government spending proposals. So it enables the government to raise and spend money. So just bear that distinction in your head as, as we go through the session this morning, that Parliament and legislature is, is separate from the executive and they have those specific roles. Of course, we're going to be talking today about the devolved context and devolved administrations. Um, in the UK, of course, we have these three devolved uh, areas. We have the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. You're going to be hearing from Emma talking about how researchers can engage there in a moment. We have the Northern Ireland Executive and the Northern Ireland Assembly, and uh, you'll be hearing from Eileen soon too. And we have the uh, Welsh Government and the Welsh Parliament as well, and, and Hannah's here to talk to us about that. So if you live or work in one of these devolved areas, there is an extra layer of representation and decision making between the UK Parliament in Westminster and any more local government. Um, so there are representatives such as MSPs, MLAs, MSs sitting in the legislatures in those or the assemblies in those devolved areas. And as you'll know, some powers are devolved to those devolved administrations. Um, the powers that are devolved are, are regulated or legislated on locally and those that are reserved and decided on in the UK Parliament are those which, which tend to affect the country as a whole. Um, things like defence, foreign policy, nuclear energy, that kind of thing. So as we go through the session today, hopefully you'll get much more of an insight about the uh, areas, the policy areas that are devolved to each area, how those legislatures or assemblies work and how you as researchers can get involved with those different legislatures. So I'm really pleased uh, to introduce you to our first speaker, um, who is Emma Robinson from the Scottish Parliament. Uh, Emma is Head of Inquiries and Collections at the Scottish Parliament Information Centre or SPICE um, and Emma's going to talk to us a bit about uh, 
how researchers, how academic engagement happens at the Scottish Parliament and how you as researchers can get involved. So Emma, it is over to you. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today a little bit about the Scottish Parliament. As um, you know, said, I'm Emma Robinson and I work in SPICE. Um, this is, Naomi's already covered this, but it's always, always useful um, to remind everybody about um, a very important distinction between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. Um, I work for the Scottish Parliament, not the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government is a separate organisation um, and the Scottish Parliament um, serves a very different role and function. The primary function of the Parliament is to scrutinise the government. Um, so here are some of the examples of areas that are devolved and those that are reserved. Um, it's usually the way that we kind of describe it is the devolved areas are things that affect sort of everyday, everyday people's everyday lives. So health, education, transport, um, and it says tourism, but I don't think any of us are benefiting from tourism at the moment, to be honest. And reserved areas, um, defence, immigration and employment. And as you can imagine, as a devolved legislature, it provides quite a challenge with all the different crossovers of subjects. So what do we do in SPICE? Um, SPICE is the central research hub in the Parliament. Um, it's an internal service. We provide um, research analysis and information services to um, members and their staff. Um, our unique selling point is that we are impartial. So it's the place to come for facts um, without any spin. We quite often provide information to members and what they do with that information we have no control over. So quite often you'll see SPICE quoted in the media. Um, if there's some spin on it, you'll know it's not to do with SPICE, it's to do with what the political parties have put on that information that we have no control over. Um, SPICE, um, at the moment, we have around 50 staff and that's made up of subject specialists in the devolved subject areas plus a section of information specialists. So what we're going to talk about a little bit is about academic engagement. So within SPICE, there's a team of five of us who, um, alongside our sort of day jobs, as it were, we, pr we help um, engage with academia. And why do we do this? Well, we need to provide research and analysis to members and we need evidence to do that. And academic research is one of the resources that we use. Because um, politics is such a fast moving landscape, we just don't have capacity to know everything about every subject area. And we need, um, academic engagement allows us to access the academic expertise so we can attempt, and I say attempt, stay up to speed with the latest research. Um, it also enables um, our members and our staff within the Parliament to be better networked and have lots of external opportunities to engage. So why as an academic or researcher do you want to engage with Parliament? Well, I suppose you could say it contributes to your civic responsibility, civic society. Um, it may enhance your profile, it should enhance your profile. We're, um, and finally, also it helps provide evidence to provide evidence about research impacts, so something like REF or now KEF, all the different um, ways of evidencing your research. So here are some of the areas that research can be used within the Parliament. Um, I should really have put these in the other way because actually your research kind of starts in SPICE. So we produce briefings and blogs and we use research that has been provided by academics um, to provide evidence in those products. Um, also, we provide information to committees. We write um, briefing papers for committees and eventually um, the, um, this evidence will be provided into chamber. So sometimes you will hear um, members quoting bits of academic research that we've provided via SPICE, via you. So it's used throughout the Parliament. So here's a quick whistle stop tour of the ways that you can engage. First one is our UKRI policy inter internship schemes. This is a scheme for PhD students. Um, we've got some examples on the screen of the type of work that our interns have done. As you can see, it's quite a variety from environmental to health and social care. And um, again, renewable, renewable energy. I always have trouble saying that. Um, and we had a briefing on wild salmon. Um, this is something that we work on collaboratively um, with the other UK legislators, so we recruit jointly. Calls normally go out in June, 
with a deadline of the end of August. All the information you need to find on this is on the UKRI Policy Internship Web Scheme. Um, normally, the placements come to the Parliament for three months. We're currently running those internships um, virtually, and one of the COVID's been pretty miserable for everybody, but one of the wonderful things about COVID and the pandemic itself has shown us that we can run things virtually and we can open things up a bit more than we used to be able to. So they come to us for three months usually, and they're normally assigned a subject team within SPICE. They work with a subject researcher and meet committee clerks and attend committee meetings and answer inquiries on committee remit. But primarily they work on a subject briefing. And that's a piece of sort of more in-depth analysis, which covers either a piece of legislature, piece of legislation, sorry, or a hot topic in the parliament. And also that can lead to presenting at um, some of our seminars, which I'll mention next. The second way to engage, um, and is one of our really successful schemes, is their Scottish Parliament Academic Fellowship Scheme. Again, I'm not going to go through all the um, lists on the screen. This is a list of the current fellows that we have, well not the current fellows, but the current fellowship topics that fellows are working um, with us on. As you can see, COVID is um, um, not surprisingly mentioned on quite a few of the slides. So the fellowship scheme is aimed at post PhD candidates. Um, our next call will be going out in September this year. We advertise around about eight or so subject specific topics, plus we run an open call. So that's your opportunity to persuade us that we should be um, getting some academic research on a topic that we might not know we need, but you can potentially persuade us that we should be knowing about. Um, fellowship is more about an in-depth piece of analysis or primary research, something that we would just not have capacity to do or the subject expertise um, in-house to, to use. Fellowships are quite flexible. We've had a, a fellowship that's been with us full time for three months. We've had fellowships that have lasted 12 months and they've worked from home. There's a lot of flexibility there and we also provide funding usually of up around um, up to five thousand pounds um, worth of funding. Normally fellows come to us with joint funding from funding they found themselves from the universities and funding that we provided as well. Third way to engage is our seminar series. At the moment we're having a bit of a lull because of Covid but primarily the breakfast seminars um, that we run were an internal opportunity to give members a safe space to discuss issues um, within Parliament. Um, we'd invite academics along to um, chat about subject areas. The seminars were 30 minutes long. We served breakfast, which I think is one of the key reasons why people used to attend. They would get a bacon roll and a cup of coffee and be able to listen to some experts on subject areas that they might not know about. Um, and some positive outcomes of that were um, committees have found academics through the seminars and invited them along as expert witnesses at um, committee meetings. MSPs are able to sort of have direct engagement with academics, which is which is one of the key benefits. And SPICE is also able to connect with new contacts to review briefings and help us with inquiries. And the final way to engage is something we call framework agreements. Um, these are short term call off contracts um, for one off pieces of work, for example, a short briefing or a committee paper. Um, some examples of the framework agreements that we've had, so obviously COVID, Brexit and COP26, which is coming up in November this year in Glasgow, is a huge focus for SPICE and the Parliament at the moment. Um, we pay a daily rate and we normally put our calls out through Twitter and on our website. So we're asked to give three top tips for engaging. Um, the key thing is to keep it relevant. Um, everyone thinks that they're um, Research is incredibly relevant, but unless it's on the parliamentary agenda, unless it's going to be discussed in Parliament, um, unless it's highlighted in the Scottish Government's programme for government, which comes out in September, it's quite unlikely that there's going to be a demand for information on it. MSPs are time poor, as we all are, and we need to um, focus on the information that's come, on the research that's needed coming up that covers things like parliamentary business and bills. So you need to either watch parliamentary debates, sign up to committee Twitters. Every committee in the parliament has a Twitter account. That gives you a feel of what business is happening at the in the parliament at the moment. The second thing is network. It's all about making connections. 
one of the key people you can connect with is your knowledge exchange people within your own organisations. Um, we run something called a SPAN, which is the Scottish Parliament Academia Network, which is a network of knowledge exchange people. They can connect with us and they will, that's the way of finding out different opportunities that are coming up. You can also contact us direct if you want more information. So that's academia at parliament .scot. Um, And the third and final thing, and also incredibly important, is make sure your research is accessible, um, right for your audience. Um, again, members of parliament are not academics. Um, they come from many walks of life and you need to make that research available. You need to kind of um, write for your audience and Spice have actually produced a writing guide which is available on our blog um, of how, how to write for the audience within the parliament. And finally it's worth saying that you need to be realistic as well about impact. Um, so for development of policy and you need to focus on the government, that's where that happens. And Parliament is once the ideas and proposals are worked up and it'll be tested in the public glare. So those are the kind of main distinctions. Finally, we can keep up with what we're doing um, is our blog. So that is um, spice-spotlight.scot and our Twitter account, which is at Spice Research. Most of our opportunities for engagement, our fellowships, um, advertising for academics for seminars are all listed on there. That's it for me. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating, really helpful uh, to hear everything about how uh, SPICE works and how Scottish Parliament is using research and all those different opportunities for researchers to feed into SPICE. I've got some great questions for you. So the first one to kick off is, is the Scottish Parliament only interested in working with academics and PhD students who are based in Scotland or are PhD students outside of Scotland and researchers outside of Scotland welcome to engage in the different schemes and activities you're running? Yes, it's a short, <laughs> it's a short answer. I think that's what, what, this, what this presentation has been really useful for is actually to realise that um, researchers have maybe a further reach than they thought they had Normally, they would maybe, if you were based in England, you would go to Westminster, but actually, you know, your, your research can be used throughout the whole of the UK. So absolutely, our opportunities are not um, um, only open to um, academics in Scotland. Um, obviously, a lot of the subject areas that we're covering are Scotland focused, but um, they're open to they're open to absolutely anybody. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Thanks, Emma. Um, great. Next question then is, um, could you say a bit about how non-academic researchers kind of fit into the landscape and feed into, into the work of the legislature? Similar. Normally we would say if you're non-academic, you kind of, um, it's quite tricky sometimes because there's not a direct route in. We would normally recommend that, for example, if you work in policy, if you're not an academic organisation, um, you get in touch with us and we can put you in touch with the relevant um, researcher or committee clerk because it's not so much we want um, expertise whether that's via acad academia or people who are actually working in the field. A good example of that would be um, last summer we created a Covid database of um, academic expertise we got rid of the word academic and we just called it the database of experts and that was to, to provide us at the beginning of the COVID pandemic with access to um, experts that we'd never really had heard of before. So all these terms like epidologists or immunologists, all these people, all these people now that we're very familiar with. Um, but we also had practitioners as well. We had GPs, we had people working in policy areas. So that's an example of um, getting expertise from the people who have the expertise. So if you're not an academic, um, some of the academic um, engagement opportunities will not be open to you because it's about engaging with academia, but that doesn't mean we don't want to engage. So I think if you're not an academic, the best thing would be to do is just to email us and we can put you in touch with relevant people within the organisation who you might be able to engage with. So 
two follow on questions there really both related uh, to what you've just said. The first one is, do people have to be UK citizens to engage with uh, the Scottish Parliament? That's the first question. And the second question is, so say someone is uh, working on a project relating to Scottish government policy, so they're working with the government, but they want to engage with Parliament. How do they figure out who in Parliament is the right person to connect up with? The answer to the first one is we've never had an application from a non UK citizen, so I can't actually give you an answer to that. It's not something um, we've dealt with so far um, and I can't again, I can't see any issue with it at all. I don't I don't really see it would be a problem. Um, so um, that's not really a great answer, but it's an honest answer. It's just we've never really we don't advertise um, these things internationally, but with the power of Twitter, things get shared. And we have been approached by um, a few international students just to kind of reach out and connect with us, but it's not really led to any actual direct engagement. But it's not something we are post off to. We're very open to any opportunity. It's about the expertise. It's about it's about getting the right person to um, provide us with the right research wherever they're from. And the second question, again, I think it's about, I mean, our website is currently a brand new website, it's just launched at the beginning of session six. We've just, if you're not aware, we've just had an election in May and beginning of this month. So we have a brand new website and a lot of the information on there is still to be updated. If you need to find, if you need to um, try and find a contact in the parliament, please just get in touch with us, get in touch with SPICE, get in touch with the just the general information services of um, the parliament, which I think is, I think it's Scottish Parliament info.scot. It's all information on the website. Um, we're very happy to be contacted and happy to put you in touch with the right person. Emma, thank you so much. Uh, for uh, such a great overview of the Scottish Parliament and how you work with academia and um, some fantastic responses to those great questions. So next I'm really pleased to introduce you to Eileen Reagan who is responsible for the finance and economics research team and knowledge exchange uh, it based in the research and information service at the Northern Ireland Assembly. Eileen thank you so much for joining us we're really looking forward to hearing from you and it's over to you. OK, thank you for uh, having me, Naomi. So today I'm going to speak to you from the Northern Ireland Assembly perspective, sharing insights from the Research and Information Service um, on how researchers can effectively engage um, with the Assembly. So this PowerPoint, um, we have about 10 minutes to work through it. So it's developed in a way that you can take it away as an aid memoir and draw on the links. It's peppered with links throughout so that you can probe more about each of the themes covered in the presentation. So I'm going to very quickly give you a whistle stop tour through understanding devolution in Northern Ireland, um, importantly looking at parameters in the timeline, but also then move on to academic engagement in the assembly context and looking for when um, academic research, research in general, is needed to support assembly work and then move on to how you might engage with the assembly and then three top tips, takeaways for you on how you might prepare fit for purpose briefings, oral as well as written. So the parameters. Um, importantly, um, it's it's academics need to understand and researchers more generally need to understand that devolution is not symmetrical in the United Kingdom. So you do need to have some cognizance of what's devolved and what's not. And in the Northern Ireland context, it's even more important to understand that in the non-devolved category, those are the powers that stay in the UK, um, governments realm and the parliament that we have accepted as well as reserved. And the important thing to understand about that is reserve powers sometimes become devolved powers. It's rare, it's not often, but it's important to understand that. And if you're interested in looking at the actual legislation, I've put the, uh, I've embedded the uh, links there to very key legislation in terms of setting up devolution in Northern Ireland. So this may be helpful for you to look at in future. Um, it highlights for you the transferred, accepted and reserved powers. And I point out again that transferred, they're the devolved, 
and you can see the long list there. And important to highlight to you is that Social Security is a devolved area, which is unlike the other devolved regions. Um, for you researchers that work in that area, we're very interested in receiving your research concerning um, Social Security. Um, and in terms of the accepted, we don't really look at them in, ter in terms of the devolved area, um, the devolved um, assembly, uh, as well as the executive. In, re in relation to reserved, um, there's a long list there. Um, justice used to be on that list, but then it was devolved uh, a short time after devolution. And there were reasons for um, that are born out of the uh, the history of Northern Ireland and um, its emergence from a conflict situation. So remember, transferred or devolved and non-devolved include accepted, which will never come to Northern Ireland and reserved which generally won't come to Northern Ireland, but there may be on occasion a transference of power down the line for a particular reason. So another thing to consider when you're thinking about devolution in the Northern Ireland context is the timeline, because we have different um, we, we have different scenarios. So we've either had devolution or we've been in suspension when there's direct rule or we've been in some other status, which was more recent. And on the slide there, you can see the significance of that. When we've had devolution, obviously the assembly is fully functioning. When we've had direct rule, which is the second bullet point there, that's when we've been governed from the United Kingdom government. And those are the dates um, for you to look at. But more recently, from January 2017 to January 2020, we had a strange situation where we were neither under direct rule, but neither fully functioning as a devolved institution. So we were kind of in this political hiatus. And the significance of that was that there wasn't a lot of um, decision making in terms of policy and legislation. It was kind of maintaining the status quo. Um, and the permanent secretaries of each of the departments were responsible for the delivery of services and they were acting under the authority of the Secretary of State. The reason why I'm highlighting these things about the parameters and the timeline is it's quite significant for you um, when you consider your um, future research proposals or when you consider disseminating your research because who's governing obviously shapes the policy and legislative context for Northern Ireland. Importantly, it points you to where you should be looking for a policy and where you should be looking for legislation, obviously, um, as well as where you should look for relevant data, because depending on whether we're in devolution or not or other, will govern where you're looking for the policy, the legislation and data, which institutions, is it central institutions you're looking at or is it the devolved institutions? And the, the reason why you want to know this is because when you formulate proposals, uh, maybe you're applying to UKRI for some money, you need to understand um, who you're looking to shape or influence um, going forward in terms of your research findings. And similarly, when you're looking to disseminate, you want to make sure that you target um, the institution that's actually in power so you can maximize the impact of the findings. So now we're going to move on to the next theme in looking at examples of when research is needed the assembly um, when we engage in academic and um, engagement. <laughs> so if you think of the assembly and its business, think of it in three discrete categories. There's plenary business, there's committee business and the constituency business. So plenary business is when they all sit in the chamber. And committee is obviously when the committees are um, running and that's this um, the statutory committees that mirror the departments and there's also standing committees such as procedures business um, audit public accounts committee things like that or there's ad hoc committees we have two at the moment one is on a bill of rights and the other is on COVID-19 and unusually that COVID-19 committee is sitting as a whole so it's the entire plenary that sits to um, and, and form the membership of that ad hoc committee and then another area that sometimes is forgotten about is the constituency work that's when members go out into their districts and they obviously engage with their voters um, so they may, for a whole raft of reasons, be needing research. It may be 
to advance their understanding on a particular issue because they're going to bring a motion or it may be that they want to bring a piece of legislation. So in those three contexts, you see these three types of business, executive and departmental business when the assembly is advising or scrutinizing things coming forward from the executive and departments. In terms of bills and the related consultations that go with it, you may have bills coming out of the executive of the department. A growth area is when you have them coming from the MLAs, the private members who are bringing forward legislation, as well as, and this is rare, you might have bills coming out of the assembly committees. Um, and in those contexts, it's really important for the committees to learn um, to, the, um, to see what local research findings there are to help inform the policy of that bill, the policy objective, as well as to inform the financial implications maybe arising out of it. Um, that's if you're um, the committee or the member actually forming a bill. But if the committees and the assembly as a whole as the plenary are looking to scrutinize legislation coming out of the executive or the department, they equally need research in order to be able to do that effectively. Um, and it also helps them to probe the proposals that are coming from the executive or departments because it gives them an evidence base. Additionally, there are committee inquiry, micro inquiries, which are happening more increasingly that are almost like um, stakeholder events with round tables to do information gathering. And there's often a related consultation around that. So it's they the committees particularly undertake um, inquiries, micro inquiries when they're trying to proactively engage in an area that maybe they think the executive, the department is neglecting. So or it just may be an area that's of particular interest in the, to them. And obviously it's typically in a devolved area. Sometimes it's not. More recently, we're seeing it in terms of the protocol um, under the Withdrawal Act, um, the Internal Market Act rather, which implements the withdrawal agreement relating to UK exit. So if you want, you can look at those links to see in future how you might be able to engage and you can see what's going on at the moment. So there's other ways that you might seek to engage. Obviously, there's the MLAs and their support staff and simply by contacting them. But the important thing to be aware is if you're reaching out to one political party, it can impact the perception of your research um, in the wider community going on. Um, so it's something always to be mindful of. And additionally, similar with political parties and their support staff. So bear those in mind um, when you engage. Sometimes it's good to engage across all the parties. Additionally, there's the Women's Caucus. Um, they undertake work, um, obviously, in the context of looking at gender mainstreaming, for example, or gender budgeting. Um, there's a link there that if you want to learn more about them and you can reach out to them simply by emailing them. All party groups is also another area that you may wish to engage with. Obviously, it goes across all the port parties and they're usually organized around themes or areas of interest. Currently, there's about 44 of them. Um, they range from autism to planning to they're, they're quite wide and diverse um, in the areas that they look at and cover. But again, I encourage you to look um, at the uh, using the link there to see all of them that exist. In addition, there's other ways of engagement, and that's legislative and university partnerships. In the assembly context, the Knowledge Exchange Seminar Series has been the most success successful initiative on this front, and that's where we have worked um, with the Research and Information Service has worked with the local universities to agree um, an annual program where there's an open call and the local universities can apply. Working with um, academics from across the United Kingdom or elsewhere who also might to join in that submission, um, which is made via the university partner academics or researchers. Um, we haven't run KESS now since the political hiatus 2017 to 2020, but I'm very happy to say that we're actively planning for a program um, in the near future. So keep an eye out on our website. Um, you can see the website address there as well as our email and Twitter.
Um, additionally, um, the, very active for a number of years has been the Interparliamentary Research and Information Network, in particular the Knowledge Exchange Group. Um, we meet regularly the, the, the individual group, the Knowledge Exchange Group, throughout the year and communicate with one another and do joint work. But the Interparliamentary Research and Information Network, we do that, um, we have an annual conference um, where we meet and all the individual groups come together. There's other groups called the Interparliamentary Financial Information Network, which is a spin-off of IPBREN, and we also have another one on data visualization. Um, we are starting to try and encourage um, academics to come and engage in those annual conferences. I'd say IPFIN, the Interparliamentary Financial Information Network, has been the most successful on that front, but we'll look to grow um, more engagement in terms of the other groups and with the overall annual conference every year. Um, so now engaging with committees, um, the first and foremost thing is uh, be proactive. Write to the committees um, and engage with them on what they're reaching out for, but also things that you have that are new that could be of interest to them in terms of proposals you have for research, findings you have coming out of research that you've undertaken, as well as just your general expertise. And three examples of when you can do that is when they're looking at things coming out of the department in terms of policy or public finance, say like public finance, like the budget, or in terms of um, how they are looking to um, bring forward legislation, um, a, a department, an MLA, or the individual committee itself. They, they need expertise in order to inform their decision making. Um, but you can be proactive and send it in via the clerk, any information that you have. And the important thing to understand is that anything you send to the committee has to be recorded. Some people aren't aware, aren't aware of that. And if you send it, then you're putting yourself on their radar um, as a person with certain expertise. Um, and similarly with the in inquiries and the micro inquiries, um, if you're aware that they're doing work in that area, don't wait to be asked. Proactively submit your information um, and be very clear about the relevance of your research to what they're looking at. That linkage is imperative if you, um, you know, want to be taken up. Um, and it doesn't mean just because you send it in that they're automatically going to take you up on your offer, but you be proactive and maybe you don't only um, communicate through the, the clerk, maybe you also try to look at the membership of the committee and engage with the members on an individual basis. Another place that you can um, engage is with RAISE. Um, it's really important to be proactive and to reach out to the, in, um, the researchers that work in your area. If you use that email address, um, as, as has been done in the past, you can be put in contact with individual researchers that work within certain portfolios. Um, always keen to get your research pr um, proposals and um, maybe help to comment and provide um, insights. Also about sharing your findings, that is gold dust to us because it makes us do our job more easily. Um, networking with research officers is always good because it can help to keep you abreast of things as well. Um, there's roundtable discussions and um, internships, um, fellowships not so much of late, um, because of the political hiatus, um, but also just uh, engaging with different networks. And more importantly, it's also about engaging with RAISE so that we create a more applied research cult culture in Northern Ireland universities and beyond. So we would engage with maybe um, curricular proposals or impact case study returns um, so that, again, there's that linkage between the academia and the assembly. And there's others as well, but we don't have time. So these, this is just to provide um, you examples of way of how you can indirectly engage. And when I say indirectly, I mean that you can um, keep abreast of what's happening um, and see where it might be helpful for the research that you're doing, or maybe a research proposal that you have um, in mind in future, or findings that you have and where you think you could target them and disseminate them. OK, so you can take that list and refer to it for future 
Um, I just would like to highlight that um, the assembly web pages for the committees, that's the home page for them. And on the links that I put there for raise, they're just the multiple examples of things that we do that would help to illustrate for you. Um, the cast link is back on the other side if you're interested in looking at that. Uh, and these are just more, again, about enabling you to navigate the assembly website. Um, it, it can be very clunky and it is being worked on to enhance it. But something really important to draw your attention to is you can watch live proceedings. Um, so the link is there as well as read official reports if you know something that has happened, because that can help you shape your um, your proposals or even your findings going forward. And the official report is the Hansard, Hansard, it's the verbatim record of proceedings in the assembly, either plenary and some committee proceedings. And this is just other types of things that you're encouraged to participate in when they arise. If we're having round tables in the past, we've had them on what work centers in Northern Ireland. Um, and also for those of you that may still be in the midst of your PhD, um, engaging with the UKRI PhD policy internship program. Um, it's a great opportunity for people to work in the dedicated research service for three months, raise that is. Um, and th there's also opportunities that exist at the other um, legislatures in the United Kingdom. Um, and then there's just various types of things that we try to do with the knowledge exchange group I spoke about earlier um, across the, the parliaments. Um, in terms of engaging with UKRI and the individual research councils. Um, and another thing is, is we do have a register of experts, but um, you're almost better to use that email address that I put on the earlier slide in order to make contact because they're, they're trying to, um, it's under construction really to upgrade what was there before for the register of experts. Now, three tips very quickly. Um, if you want to have uh, relevant research for a policy and legislative context, you've got to routinely horizon scan. And that's why the, this PowerPoint provides um, links for you to get in there and demystify where you should be looking in order to stay relevant. Um, and be proactive is my second tip. Um, make contact with key players on more than one front and don't give up and do that when you develop your proposals and when you disseminate. Engage with Ray's, engage with the clerks. It can vary as to how much the clerks will engage. Um, and also engage with uh, departmental officials as well, like at events, like at CAS. CAS provides a great opportunity for you to do that. And when we get back and running, hopefully you'll be able to do that. Um, going forward, but also engage with the Women's Coalition, reach out to the all party groups, you know, be proactive and several fronts. You can't just pursue one or two or three paths. You must pursue several um, and look at it from the beginning and look at it all the way through to the end when you're looking to disseminate your research findings. Um, and finally, I think um, if more and more researchers, we found this through CAS, that if more and more enter and multi um, disciplinary research is undertaken, it, it's more fit for purpose in terms of policy and lawmaking. Um, so that applied research is something, uh, culture is something that we're really trying to encourage and nurture so that we do actually have evidence informed policy and lawmaking. OK, thank you. Eileen, thank you so much uh, for a whistle-stop tour through devolution in Northern Ireland and how you work with researchers and many, many different opportunities for academics and other experts to engage with you. I really appreciate your time today. Unfortunately, because of a technical issue, we can't put any of your questions to Eileen right now, uh, but we're going to move on to our next and final speaker. I'm really pleased to uh, introduce you now to Hannah Johnson, who is a Knowledge Exchange and Engagement Manager in Research Services at the Welsh Parliament, Senedd Cymru. Um, and Hannah, we're really looking forward to hearing from you about uh, how researchers can work with the Welsh Parliament. So I will hand straight over to you, Hannah. Thanks very much. Thanks, Naomi. Um, so good morning, everyone. 
Um, I'm going to quickly run through, uh, as Emma did, um, the Welsh policy landscape, opportunities to engage with the CNF, uh, different research applications, and then my top tips for engagement. So as you've gathered already, uh, the devolution settlement is different in each country of the UK. And the Welsh situation has probably changed the most since 1999. For example, the Senate changed its name last year and only acquired uh, primary lawmaking powers in 2006. And as you can see from this slide, in Wales, laws and policies on lots of important issues are decided and implemented by the Welsh Parliament and the Welsh Government. And these devolved issues include things like health, education, economic development, housing and lots more. The remaining reserved issues also affect Wales, and these include most taxes, social security, immigration and defence. And these are decided at a UK level by the UK Parliament and UK Government. The Welsh Parliament, or Senedd Cymru in Welsh, formerly known as the National Assembly for Wales, as if we didn't need another name, is the name of the 60, 60 members of the Senedd who are elected every five years. And as Emma said, we also just had an election, so we've got uh, lots of new members. And the Parliament represents the people of Wales, checks and challenges the work of the Welsh Government through rigorous scrutiny, makes and changes laws for Wales, debate, debates the important issues of the day and checks and approves government spending, including budgets and devolved taxes. The Welsh Government, on the other hand, is the name of a completely separate institution. And the government is formed by the party or parties that commands the confidence of the Senedd, either by winning a majority or in coalition. Certain members of the Senate are chosen to be ministers who go on to run government departments, which do the day-to-day -day running of public services and propose new laws to the Senate. And the government is accountable to the Senate, which means that ministers have to answer questions every week and committees undertake inquiries into their actions. And as with other parliaments, this sort of scrutiny is critical in a democracy, and this scrutiny has to be based on good evidence. So as you can see, each institution serves very different purposes. The Senedd does its work a lot more publicly and involves people with a wide range of opinions, and the government has a lot more practical impact. And both of these things you should bear in mind when engaging. And there are lots of opportunities for researchers to engage with the Senedd so that their work can inform democratic debate. Uh, Senedd committees are a really key way to have your say on issues being scrutinised by the Senedd and to influence debate. They scrutinise draft laws and budgets and hold inquiries into government actions. They collect written evidence, hold public hearings, and they also undertake lots of innovative citizen engagement activities too. And committees rely really heavily on rigorous research to inform their decision making, because obviously good decisions are based on good evidence. Senath Research, uh, similar to SPICE, is the Senath's in-house research service, which is where I work. And we support all members and committees in all of their roles in a completely impartial way. We answer questions confidentially, we write briefings for committees and we publish lots of research for everyone to read on our website. And we use research, the research community in lots of ways through academic fellowships where researchers come to work with us for a few months on a specific project in a very similar way to in the Scottish Parliament. And the next call for fellowships we'll, we'll, we'll put out in the autumn, so keep an eye out for that. And similar to in Scotland, we'll have a directed call and an open call. And we also commission research and we run an expert register specifically for COVID, which anybody can sign up to, so academic or non-academic. And we've got people from all over the world on our register. We've got um, a few hundred people on there, people from Canada and Denmark and all sorts of places. So it's a really you know, incredible source of information for our committees and for our researchers and for our members. And in the new Senedd term, we're increasingly offering new opportunities, for example, to write guest articles and to undertake rapid evidence reviews. And we're also part of the UKRI PhD internship scheme, which Emma mentioned previously. And individual members of the Senedd also have specific interests, and it's worth bearing them in mind as a user of research in the Parliament. They might act as party spokespeople on particular issues or be campaigning on a particular thing. And political parties use research to create their policies and campaigns too. Cross-party groups are also worth highlighting because they use re research in their work as well. 
The Sun Earth also offers other opportunities like events and even exhibition space. And they're also dabbling in lots of other things like podcasts. So it's always worth keeping an eye on the opportunities because there's such a broad range of things to get involved with. And it's worth noting that the new Senef term is a really good opportunity for impact because we've got new committees being established at the moment and they're a key place of impact uh, for the next five years. So I'd recommend following the ones that are most relevant to your work when they're established because they haven't been established yet. So keep up to date with their new inquiries, calls for evidence and the, the legislation that they're scrutinising. And I think it's worth noting that the research world in Wales is smaller and our institution is smaller. So you've, you have a good chance of achieving impact. And researchers often tell us that after engaging with us, they're offered opportunities in the media and with other government bodies. So it's, uh, it's a really good opportunity to engage. And in the next few months, I'll also be expanding our knowledge exchange programme. Uh, to connect researchers from Wales and beyond to broaden, deepen and diversify the evidence that's used to inform democratic debate in the Senate. And we'll be providing lots of exciting opportunities and hopefully we'll be setting up a dedicated Twitter account and a portal of opportunities, potentially developing areas of research interest and we'll be providing lots of tools and training to assist. And you'll all have really amazing expertise uh, to inform the decisions affecting Wales. And some of the areas of expertise you'll have are straightforwardly applicable to policy, such as mental health or ecology or economics. But others of you might be thinking that your research isn't applicable to policy, but you'd be quite surprised because in the last few years I've worked with academics uh, looking at philosophy and rights on a piece of work around prisoner voting. We've worked with psychologists on vaccine hesitancy and experiences of self-isolation during the pandemic. We've worked with GIS experts to map access to banking and remote working hubs and hospital driving times. We worked with a professor of population studies to, uh, to uh, map housing need and demographics. And my particular favourite, we worked with an expert in pop music on the impact of the pandemic on live music. So here are my top tips for engaging. Um, as Emma said, I think knowing your audience and the context is key. And this means considering what you want to achieve and how you're most likely to achieve it, rather than just throwing your research over the wall and running away in the hope that it will have impact. And in practice, that might mean adapting your work for different contexts. For example, if you're responding to a committee inquiry or you've been commissioned by a research service. And it means keeping up to date and building relationships, as Emma said, with people like me and knowledge mobilisers in your institutions. And it's really important to, to, to know these things so that you time your, your influence well. So if the Senate's considering a new air quality law, which it will be, and this, your re research relates to this, make sure you're clued into the deadlines for scrutiny, otherwise you'll miss your opportunity for influence. My second tip is to find a balance between concision and precision. Um, one of the key challenges when policymakers and researchers work together is, is about this tone of communication. Researchers want to explain nuance and caveats and policymakers want confidence and clarity and concision. And there's a balance to be found, but knowing your audience well will help to adapt your communication. And as Emma said, policymakers are really busy people and they probably won't have time to read a 50 page report. So give them what they need up front and be very clear about how it helps them. And that might mean putting your conclusions and recommendations and a, an executive summary at the top of a document. And just to reiterate that, that politicians that are usually not technical ex experts in particular areas, which means your communication should be accessible and not assume any existing knowledge. And I always recommend writing as if you're explaining something to a clever friend rather than a colleague working in the same field. And my final tip is to be creative in applying your research. And this might mean, uh, as I just said um, in the previous slide, understanding the current policy landscape and finding ways to apply your research in creative ways. So if you're tapped into the parliament and you have a good idea of what issues are on the agenda, you'll be able to apply your skills and research in lots of different ways. Here are my details. If you want any advice 
uh, or if you want to be kept up to date on what's going on in my in my parliament and our web pages will be populated with all of our new opportunities and tools and training and all sorts of things so thanks so much that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Hannah. Again, really enriching and great to see the similarities and differences between uh, the Welsh Parliament and Scottish Parliament and, and Westminster. So I've got some great questions here. We're not going to be able to cover them all off, but this is my favourite one because the person begins, sorry to be so stupid, and there are no stupid questions. I think it's probably the best one. The person says, sorry to be so stupid, but do members of the Welsh Parliament sit in Westminster as well? Do they get elected in the same elections as MPs? in Westminster so if you could kind of clarify for us how the two relate to each other I think that's a really great question. Um, so the, the UK Parliament and the Welsh Parliament are completely separate institutions so they have completely separate elections and the members of the Welsh Parliament don't sit in Westminster. We've got members that were formerly members of the Lords or uh, were MPs but they're, they're not elected at the same time they're completely separate elections. Um, I think we've probably got time just for one more question. Um, so how do you measure if the public is reading the research that you're posting on your website? Oh, that's a very interesting question. So we use lots of metrics. So we, we track, uh, you know, the number of views, the number of hits on particular pages. We can see uh, how many people have read down to the bottom of pages. So on our guest articles, how many people have downloaded documents. But then we're also quite active on social media and we use those metrics, you know, in the way that lots of people do. So tweet impressions and engagements and retweets and things like that. Um, um, we're on LinkedIn and, and, and uh, Facebook as well. So we track uh, engagement across lots of different platforms, which obviously in a, a quantitative way isn't ideal, but it's it's what we've got to work with. Hannah, thank you so much for such a brilliant uh, whip through the Welsh Parliament and your use of research and some great tips as well. I hope that that has given you some ideas about the different policy areas that are devolved to those devolved administrations, a bit of information about how those devolved administrations use research and there has been some great tips um, about how you as a researcher can feed your expertise into those legislatures. Uh, some, some similar and some a little different. You've got lots of links as well um, and contact details for people working in those legislatures. Um, so hopefully that gives you lots of good uh, information to go away with and use. Just to give you an idea um, at the UK Parliament, you have the Knowledge Exchange Unit. That's myself. It's Sarah, who we've heard from asking your questions, and it's also my colleague Laura as well. Um, and we are here to support you as researchers to engage with the UK Parliament. We've got lots of online resources, how to guides, uh, contact details, information and advice on our web hub, which is parliament.uk forward slash research hyphen impact. On there as well, we have recordings of our other, other online training sessions. So there's a half hour session on how you engage with the UK Parliament as a researcher, and there's some thematic sessions as well, such as working with select committees or writing for a parliamentary audience. So do go and check those out if you would like to watch some training um, on the UK Parliament. We're also on Twitter. If you follow us on Twitter, we are at UKPAL underscore research. We put on there any opportunities we can find for you to engage with the UK Parliament, but also opportunities we see from our colleagues at devolved legislatures as well. So when SPICE, uh, when research services are at Senate Cymru, uh, when RAISE at the Northern Ireland Assembly have opportunities for researchers to engage, we pop them on our Twitter feed as well. So we try and pull it all together in one place for you. And if you'd like any more information or you have more questions about working with the UK Parliament, just get in touch with us. We're on KEU Knowledge Exchange Unit, KEU at parliament.uk. Thank you for joining us and uh, have a good day.